investors in super are over the 1.6 million cap, then did you say that if you want to segregate assets to accumulation in excess of the 1.6 million, this is meant to be done by 3rd of June? No. No. The idea is that you need to have in place the documentation, first of all, to say that to the trustees of the fund, uh, once you've established what my debt balance is, prior to finalising the accounts to the fund for the end of the year, uh, any excess in my pension account is over 1.6 needs to be rolled back to accumulation. Right. Once, once you've established that, the next thing is using the segregation method, um, pick the assets that you are going to roll back. Now, that cannot be done on the 3rd of June. No, that's it. So therefore what ends up happening is therefore the, the after the 30th of June and falls of time, you go going through individually looking at your investments to say, well that's an asset that I can see is fully going, you know, I can't see it's going to have a lot of rough tide, it's got a lot of unrealised gains. Yes. And, and then let's say if you're at uh, 2 million and you've got 400,000, yeah. you have to pick individual assets. You don't have to make up the full 400,000 the assets you pick. But if you go above the 400,000, that will mean effectively if you pick 500,000 because you can see you've got 500,000 worth of assets at a full value, you're actually going back to 1.5 million. Yeah, uh, just quickly, the second question was, I read somewhere that the revaluation of the cost base uh, could be the highest value of the, the shares uh, between 19th of November 2016 and 3rd of June 2017. Is that correct? No. No. I mean, this is one of the things, if you look at the capital gains tax concession, it says the primary uh, reason to be using it is uh, to deal with the assets that are transferred back to accumulation. Uh, yes. People who are going to try and pick their time as to when they transferred it, um, anyone who says, well, gee, BHP was at their top, then I'll pick that at the time I'll transfer and this asset off, because that would mean that the excess over 1.6 million will not be done in one clean dollar value, it will be done at all of different times. And that would be just impractical. But you have to pick the third of the junior value. It's, it's the most practical way to do it. I mean, you, you don't have to, but you, you need to be having, like, if you already know that you've got $3 million in your super fund and then there was an advantage charm, you can say, gee, back then, I'll put in place the documentation to say that that's what I decided to do some of the pension back to accumulation and so this is going to be uh, the time of doing the um, uh, rollback to accumulation and these are the assets at that time. Because the, 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 the value of the assets has to coincide with the value of the rollback. Yes, but I um, still wasn't quite sure whether you, if you didn't use the actual cost of the asset then... Uh, no, it's always market value. It's always market value like the 3rd of June? Or when you roll back, so yeah, but the 3rd of oh, June, that would be a... So if you roll back earlier, you could roll back progressively from uh, last uh, uh, November to uh, uh, June this year, could you? It'd be a heck of a lot of administration. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And, 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 and you would be at risk of the tax office saying, now, uh, come on, you know, there's the spirit of the law, there's the yeah. letter of the law, and, and they can say you're doing this purely for, for tax purposes yeah. and knock you out. I understand. Right. Thank you. I'm just interested in the underlying justification for an international market investment against Australian market investment. When, if you're looking at the index levels, the Australian market often tracks fairly closely other in, other major international markets like the um, Standard and Poor's or the British ones. Is that is that a reasonable supposition, or does the is there actually quite a big difference in the market index performance between Australia and other major Western? There's definitely been times. I mean, the US market is doing much better than the Australian market at the moment, for example. Um, but Australia makes up two percent of the world's stock markets. So I mean, you know, yes, there there is some reasons for being in, a, in the Australian stock market due to you know tax, which maps you know with imputation tax and whatever else. But you are definitely under diversified from a global point of view if you're only in Australian stocks. I'll just add to that briefly. Every July um, 
I do a piece for Eureka, which is basically something for everybody in this room as a self-managed super fund and wants to sort of compare what they're doing uh, to what they could do if they left it all to uh, an index manager such as Vanguard. I think for every one of the last five or six years, not having ads international in your portfolio uh, has, has cost you, uh, in some years, substantially. Uh, we're doing it again this year. I think Australia might have, might have uh, won, but to say that they're fairly closely correlated is just, uh, no, they're not. Um, and having that diversification, uh, particularly uh, for international, uh, for the last five or six years has been, you've missed out if you haven't. Now, I, I see that, uh, quite a few, oh, we all want to get on, we all want to get on this one. Uh, if you, uh, I, I see over the nine and a half years I've been writing for Eureka, I've seen a lot of uh, Eureka readers uh, at my office. And uh, you, you've got dumbbells, that is Australian equities at one end and cash at the other end, and there's been very little in the way of fixed interest, international shares, uh, and, uh, and property outside of uh, direct property. Um, that has improved a little bit over, the, over that 10 year period, but certainly um, uh, be under no uh, misunderstanding that uh, if you haven't been an international in the last five or six years, you have missed out. Even something as simple as a, a Vanguard international hedged uh, fund or something like that would have added significantly to your portfolio at that time. And, and just adding to what uh, my two colleagues have, have just said, the other thing too is diversification. You have the international equities as an asset class, but within international equities, you have um, the uh, developed countries and you have the developing countries. Countries. So there's diversification within uh, being diversified in international equities too. So when you look at these things, you just can't look at it too simply. Um, and so from a point of view of, you've got to drill down and, and, and look at um, uh, within each of the asset classes, um, there's further diversification that's required. It's actually really interesting because the, and it's completely true, so as I said, for our international portfolio, yes, you could go buy Vanguard and just do a MISCI or something like that, um, MSCI. Our expertise is within the, the asset allocation within international. So, for example, we're currently a little bit overweight in Europe. Yeah, so how we buy all of our different ETFs, there's you know, several in there, we can go overweight. You know, the majority will be within an MSCI um, I think we've got a little bit extra in um, the US uh, big cap. So then even within the US, do you go big cap, do you go small cap, do you go mid caps? Um, you know, do you go Europe, do you go emerging markets? Um, Asia, Asia emerging, I mean there is a whole numerous different drilling down to different asset classes or sub-asset classes within the asset class. But now that we've been taxed the accumulation fund, can you offset therefore capital losses against capital gains before you capital loss in your pension mode <laughs> is tax free? It's of no use to the capital loss. So, so, so now it would be worth to sell your capital loss making shares and offset it against uh, future cap capital gains in the accumulation fund. This is the, the reason that the government has done what it has in regards to uh, uh, being able to choose what you apply CDT relief for on, uh, from July 1. So if you have 20 assets in your portfolio, some of which are straight in shares, some of which are bonds, uh, property, etc., you need to sit down and go through line by line, asset by asset, which assets you want to apply the CDT relief for and which assets you don't want to apply the relief for. Now, prima facie, the assets that you uh, have, uh, have losses sitting in, uh, you probably don't want to apply the relief, the CDT relief to, um, because if you have a loss of $10,000 sitting on that asset and that's being transferred back to accumulation rate if it's proportionate, but there'll be a proportion of that that you're going to use to offset any gains that are also being made in the accumulation phase. So you're selling, just a practical example, you're selling uh, Woolies in which you've got uh, a $10,000 loss, um, half of which is in pension, half of which is in accumulation, and uh, you've done quite well on some uh, bank stocks, uh, CDA or even a CSL, um, uh, which I know is $132 this morning. Um, and, and there's a $10,000 gain 
there, yes, and the losses that you made on whatever I said, what did I say, bullies, um, uh, can be offset against, against the game, yeah. Okay. Uh, the other thing is, uh, if you've got a large uh, super fund and therefore, and you, for instance, you had 4.8 million, you could you go 1.6, 1.6, 1.6, so three separate funds, or would the government regard as the tax of the commission? Depends on what you can't, you can't have three, sorry, you're talking to yourself and a partner? No, just if one person has a fund, yep. can they split it, and it's too large, can you split it in three different funds, each being under the 1.6, so you don't pay tax on the accumulation part. So does that regard as the tax avoidance measure? Um, please do it, and I'd love to be your accountant because I'll get rich and I think you'd get poorer. Um, I, I don't really see the sense of having three funds because you've just got to cut it back to. You're going to have um, some of your superannuation in pension and some of it in accumulation. Uh, having three funds, there isn't a third type of superannuation that you'd get any benefit from that. So the idea is, is you'll have one fund with 1.6 million in, and you might have another fund with 3.2. If you're doing the three fund thing, I don't know whether you'd get a benefit. In fact, I don't think you would. And no, you can't have three pension funds. You can only have the, the pension account transfer balance goes across all pension or all superannuation pensions, and that's why the 1.6 million is not only made up of the value of account-based pensions as at the 30th of June, but also anyone receiving a lifetime pension, uh, the, the yearly value is multiplied by 16 to come up with how much that is in the 1.6. So, no, you can't have um, three pension accounts. It's one pension balance per person. In fact, before I said it's going to be very, um, people shouldn't end up exceeding the 1.6 million. Uh, especially if they have a self-managed super fund. The only time where this can happen inadvertently is um, where people have a multitude of, of, of funds, and, but it'd be hard for them to have multitudes of pension funds around too. So uh, it's going to be very hard to end up being over it, and there's no real benefit from that point of view. So it's all of your pension accounts throughout the Australian superannuation fund industry, whether they be uh, um, lifetime benefit pensions or account-based pensions. Thank you. Thank you. Just the situation, two member super fund, both in the pension phase, both members over 70 years of age. One's a little bit over the 1.6 million, one's a little bit under the 1.6 million. Um, the one that's over takes the excess amount and puts it into the accumulation account. So everything's okay on the 30th of June 2017. What happens on, two, on the 30th of June 2017 under two scenarios? One, the funds have made a 20% increase, and another, they've lost 20%. Sorry, are you, are you saying 30th of June 2018? You're talking about a year later? What happens a year later? Yeah. Right, okay, sorry, you said Under sorry, those sorry. two scenarios. Yeah, okay, um, uh, nothing. Um, you've used the $1.6 million cap at the start. If you uh, punt that whole 1.6 million on a penny dreadful that goes to zero, then you've used your 1.6 million and you'll never get another 1.6 million. And you can't put the accumulation money back in? No, because you've used your 1.6, yeah. The person who's uh, invested well with their 1.6 and managed to double their money over the same time and got to 3.2 million, all power to them. The only problem they've now got is they have to take a higher uh, pension each year. Um, being at that age at 5% of, uh, of 3.2 million rather than 1.6. You only get one $1.6 million limit if you blow 10 or 20% of it, it's down to 1.4 something or 1.3 something uh, through uh, unlucky or, or, or bad investments. That's unfortunately uh, bad luck. So the 30th of June uh, 2017, the benchmark for the rest of your block. Well, essentially, yes, you've got the credits and, and debits, as, as Max was talking about, if you're, <laughs> if you're, if you're taking money uh, out, um, you take a minimum pension, after that you, you take out, um, uh, you rob it back um, uh, money, uh, but you, you can't, you, there's, no, there's no increase to that, to that limit, it will increase by CDI over time in $100,000 loss, so at some stage in five, six, seven, eight years' time, we'll wake up one morning and the 1.6 will become 1.7.
But that won't matter for any of you in the audience who used 1.6 million this year, you won't then get to do 1.7 million. It's designed to make up the CBI uh, down the track as all of the limits, the 25,000, the $100,000 non-concessional will be raised by CBI over time in $5,000 lots for those ones. So in five years time, can I just add, add to what Bruce just, just said then, from a point of view, if once you've got the 1.6 million, that's the end of it. The only way that you can um, go below that is if you have the partial commutation or full commutation in the back. The, the, the other thing is if someone ends up having 800,000 in a pension fund. So this is whether we like it or not, the pension account transfer balance is going to be um, affecting everybody if you're in a pension phase, whether you're at 1.6 or below. If you're going to be below 1.6, um, I'm going to throw this in. No, um, the, the, if you're at $800,000, the way it will work going forward, you will have used half of your pension transfer account balance. So if you've got 800000 now, that is what's sitting as the credit in your pension transfer account balance. If in five years' time, the pension account transfer balance uh, limit through the 100,000 limits has increased to 1.8. Two, two lots of two and So if it goes to if it goes to 1.8, what you are going to be able to do, you have 50% of uh, of your pension account transfer balances you can use. So that person can end up getting in not the difference between the 800 and the 1.8 they're going to be able to get in uh, effectively uh, the 700,000, uh, sorry, 900,000. So from a point of view of the, once you're at 1.6, that's the end of it. If you're below it, you do have the ability to increase it, but it's in a proportional basis. Okay, just to clarify that again, sorry. Um, so you've linked the 1.6 million so in future years, if the fund keeps growing, you can have 1.8, 1.9 million. Correct. Yeah. If you're a good investor and you can you get your fund to grow at a faster rate than the uh, pension that you're having to take, then all power to you, hold up. It goes back to the debits and the credits. Credits, the only thing that increases uh, uh, the pension transfer account balance is values at the 30th of June this year and rollovers, uh, accumulated income doesn't. Sorry, it is a fairly common question people do ask, do you have to reset? I think we're just going back to the original question. <coughs> if, you, uh, if, you make, if you manage to turn from 1.6 to 1.8, do you have to bring it back to 1.6? I think it's also your base question. The answer is no. So that you don't have to reset it every year. It is what it is, it grows or falls in line with, with uh, uh, how well you've invested and how much money you've drawn from your super uh, pension. If I have two super funds, is it possible to have two pension accounts? You, you like could. You, one you, year and yes, one six? Yes, you could. Um, you could have one super fund with a million and the other one with 600,000. I'd have to wonder, uh, unless if they were the only, uh, you know, if those two funds were 100% in pension phase, that'd be um, all right. But again, I'd love you to have, uh, I'd love to be your account because I'm making money and you're not really, because I can't see any reason why you'd do that. Um, if you've got two um, super funds, it will not make sense going forward to have both of those two super funds being a mixture of accumulation and pension. And I said before that the tax office is going to be looking at uh, people who are going to be uh, having a second super fund and saying, well, the reason you're doing this is to maximise tax advantages. Part 4A works where the principle and main reason that you're doing it is to gain a tax advantage. There can be administrative reasons why people would want to have all of their pension assets in one fund and their accumulation assets in another. And if you wanted to uh, be able to put the tax office off the scent, there would be nothing wrong with having the money that's in excess, that you're wanting to maximise the chance of the pension account increasing in value because of uh, accumulated uh, income and growth, and having the accumulation account in an industry fund, uh, and at some point down the track there's nothing going to stop someone who would like to prefer to end up managing that 
accumulation account in a second self medic super fund down the track. The, 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 the watchword or the thing to watch for is well, what the tax office is going to be looking for, things that are going to be happening within the next 12 months. So if it's going to make sense to have a separate super fund with accumulation accounts in it, and you don't have a separate self medic super fund now, you can still get the benefits by having your self medic super fund having all of your pension assets and your accumulation assets in another one without necessarily coming to the undue attention of the tax office. Uh, Max, the, the situation is I already have two super funds. So I'm sort of wanting to have a pension fund in both of them. It's not as if I'm going to start a second. I, 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 I don't see you get any benefit. You, you, really need, you really need to get some good advice on the basis of looking at the assets you've got in one fund, the assets in the other, look at what you've currently got. What you should be, definitely, is in pension phase for both of those funds this year. I've just been doing some sort of review for clients and seeing that they've got still some, for some reason, accounts in uh, accumulation when they could easily be in, uh, even if it's just a TTR. The taxation of TTR pensions doesn't start till 1 July. So therefore, it makes a lot of sense as long as it's not going to create a major tax problem if the person's under 60. But if, if, if the person's over 60, it doesn't make sense having a super fund, uh, having large accumulation accounts and a pension account for the 2017 year. In fact, it makes even more sense so that you can definitely use the segregation method to have the funds, both of them totally in pension phase and I just did some documentation for a client this week where he's in this situation and, and we know that we've got one fund where there's five million dollars in it and another fund with a million. Uh, effectively they'll have started the pensions in the, the million dollar fund and there'll be documentation that they'll have, 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 have prepared, we've prepared for them saying once the members balances have been assessed at the 30th of June 2017 we want those pensions to be commuted and rolled back at the 30th of June to accumulation. For the other fund, there'll be the documentation saying once you finalise the members' balances of the 30th of June, the excess over the 1.6 will be rolled back to accumulation. So I think you really need to get some advice because I can't, again, can't stress too high why you would have two self medic super funds both with pension accounts. And in fact, I can see major disadvantages. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, so I have a question on um, transferring assets into super to take uh, uh, advantage of the period left before the period to, uh, get, to get the limits. Um, is there any advantage if you were if I was transferring shares into um, a, a, a super fund, whether I should put them into the accumulation portion or into the pension portion? In terms of capital gains, you, you don't, so you don't have a choice. You, you cannot add to a pension account uh, once it's started. The only way you can do that is to roll it back to accumulation and restart. Uh, so the assets uh, under an end space transfer need to go into your accumulation accounts, and how you deal with them from there is to get them into pension is is the, uh, the next question. Thank, thanks, General. Um, just in in relation to uh, balancing a, a two member fund. Um, member one's got, uh, I'm just trying to round some numbers off, 2.3 and member two's got 900. But if we take 500 off member one and give it to member two before the end of, uh, 540 in fact, before the end of June, that would end up with 1.8 and 1.4. My question is, so 200 of the 1.8 and therefore go to accumulation. Am I right so far? Uh, okay. Yes, roughly. Just how, how old are the two members? Six, uh, over 60. Under 65? Uh, one is and one isn't. One, the, the highest one is over 65, the, the uh, lowest one's under. Well, you, you need to be aware of just making sure that the can, contribution can be made. Uh, you need to make uh, the eligibility uh, criteria in order to make it. So if the person with the 2.3 balance is pulling half a million out, no problem. If they're over 65, you just need to make sure the person, the other person, can make the contributions. So it need to be under 65 or we need to work test. Thank you. The last part of the question was, then there's 200 in accumulation, bearing in mind that they've both got a 1.6 or 1.4 yep. uh, pension. And having used the port forward 540, how soon could the 
the two in accumulation are going to the 1.4. Well, if you if you use the 540, then you've used the full three-year pull forward. Uh, so uh, yeah, let's say uh, the, the young one is 61. That would count them for the while well, they're 61, 62, and 63. In that year where they're 64, they're most likely going to be able to use uh, the pull forward rules again potentially, so long as they are 64 uh, and able to use that. At which time, in three or four years' time, the limit is likely to be $300,000. Um, under that, if they are a bit older and they're say 63 or 64 now, and the three year pull forward catches them 63, 4, 5, and they're 65 or older by the time they can do it again, then uh, anybody who's over 65 wanting to make non concessional contributions, you've got a few things to worry about. Um, the first one is uh, have they met the work test, um, in which case 40 hours during 30 days of the given financial year. And also, which I spoke about in my presentation, if you're over 1.6 million, so if they've got growth happening during that period that's taken over 1.6 million, you cannot make non-concessional contributions. And anything over 1.4 million, you have a limit. So between 1.5 and 1.6, one year's worth of NCCs, between 1.4 and 1.5, one plus one year pull forward. If they're below 1.4, then they're potentially able to put in uh, the full 300,000 using the, the pull forward provisions. Does that answer your opinion? Yeah. Query regarding the catch up rules that are coming in July next year uh, for the concessional contributions yeah. and the removal of the 10% rule, yes. which comes in this financial year. Um, in three to six years' time, is that going to be a free kick for property investors? Well, potentially, yes. Um, if you haven't made any concessional contributions uh, for the four years, which will be 18, 19, 20, and 21, and then in FY22, you make a gain of whatever, $500,000 or so, you'll potentially be able to put in, uh, reduce your capital gain by $125,000, putting that $125 into super. Uh, reducing your taxable income, which will you know, have the impact of reducing how much CGT you pay. Uh, so, uh, yes, absolutely that will. And how that will mix with the 10% rule is that um, uh, previously, if you're an employee, you made that gain, you're going to have some problems getting the money in uh, because it can only be done by your employer. Uh, and uh, if the gain's not made until late, late in the financial year and you earn $100,000 and you've already earned 80 of the 100, then it can be difficult. For the self-employed, um, the truly self-employed, uh, it's a little bit, it's a little bit Easier, you can choose when you make those, but the truly self-employed, if they're employees of their own company, have had that problem up until what, what occurs on July 1 as well. Does that answer? Yes. yes. Sorry, um, next one. Sir. Uh, I, I don't know whether I'd necessarily call it a free kick to property investors. I think what we're recognising, what they have recognised, is the fact that and when we had the higher contribution limits, there was some reason losers. I can remember back before we had simple super, depending on your age, there was uh, the amount that could be contributed and it went from 25,000 or 30 if you're under 30 and then it went up to you know, 100,000 if you're over 55 or 50. Um, it, you cannot escape the fact that people in their younger family years with mortgages don't have the same propensity to make the large super contributions. So I, I really believe it's a great thing and for another thing too, one of my jobs when I'm doing tax planning for clients coming to retirement, one of the hardest messages I have across to people, and I say to them, hey, you look after you, you know, yourself in retirement, so I've got these five investment properties. I said, well, that's great while you're in accumulation, but when you're getting a 25 to 3% income yield from the true value of your property, not really that good. And so that's going to allow a better uh, um, targeting it of when properties are sold and when super contributions are going to be able to be claimed so that in the year that you know we're going to be cleaning things up so that the people will be able to get money out of property into super as long as they don't have more than five hundred thousand um, is going to be um, able to be used to, to great advantage there's been some confusion with death benefits uh, tax as well in terms of the implications of the, the changes in the rules ATO has just put out a um, uh, I think it's a compliance guideline to help people explain the changes. Have you caught up with that and uh, what are the implications? I, I don't 
um, really said there was any much confusion in relation to the, 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 you know, the taxing of death benefits. The, the, that there's been no changes to that. You know, but before these changes, um, the situation was if taxable super passed from a member to a non-dependent, taxes paid at the 15% plus Medicare. If tax-free super is, 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 it goes across, um, it's not taxed. So uh, I don't think that's changed. Um, Check Eureka, I uh, wrote a piece uh, Tuesday night, which I think Tony published this morning, uh, on this topic. Yes, there were two uh, uh, guidelines, uh, tax office guidelines, coming out in the last month, one of which was dealing with um, an issue where uh, the ATO sort of admits that it wasn't perfectly clear when it put out, the guideline, put out some guidelines years ago. And what people had actually been doing was, instead of paying us the, the, the two main choices are if you've got a pension and it becomes reversionary, then the pension just continues to, to your spouse. Um, if, there, if it's in, uh, or it can be paid out as a death benefit, if it's in accumulation, uh, it would also be paid out as a, as a death benefit, it can't be paid out as a pension. Where the ATO said that there have been some, uh, some ongoing compliance issues, they've said we're going to let you go, but the rules will change specifically from July 1, you won't be able to get away with this anymore is that some people have been moving uh, pensions, uh, death benefit pensions, to the surviving spouse's accumulation accounts, um, which I don't know how widespread it was, but the ATO, that's what the ATO was saying, this compliance guideline. There was one released literally this week, and there was another one released uh, the end of April or early May. Um, but I have written a piece about this, here, also more information on that, which uh, Tony put up today, I believe. If one has assets, in an accumulation account on which you've sort of gained tax relief, CGT relief, does that new cost value or cost price prevail in all circumstances? And in particular, after the death or when you're passing on money to beneficiaries? The, the first thing to know, obviously, is that any money that you pass to a dependent um, it goes tax-free. So. If you, you, you hold everything superannuation, you pass it to your spouse or, or a financial dependent, it goes tax free. If you're leaving it to your adult children, then there are some, uh, there, there may be some tax to pay, um, uh, depending on the, the makeup of tax free, taxable uh, components of your super. Uh, I haven't thought through, Max, maybe you have what happens in regards to CGT relief on those assets. That's an accounting question. Um, what would happen is in the event of a member dying that has chosen to end up having uh, the capital gains tax relief for the assets that have passed across back to accumulation, those assets uh, will end up having their cost base as whatever that market value was for the date the assets were transferred back. So whatever those assets have increased since then to the date of the death of the member will be taxed and as long as that uh, you know, is happening more than 12 months afterwards, tax would be paid in the super fund at the 10% and then when the money came out of the super fund going to the non-dependents, there'd be further tax paid by them. Yeah, but the, the capital gains that are now being or will be protected as of June 30th will remain protected. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. The, 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 effectively, what the tax officer said, the way this is going to be worked, anyone who chooses to, to claim the capital gains tax relief there is a deemed sale and repurchase at the market value at the date of the claiming of the concession. So what will happen is if you've got CBA that was bought at $6 and it was worth $80 at the time of the transfer, rather than the cost base having been the old $6, the new cost base is its market value at the date that the concession is, is, is claimed. That applies after death. Applies full stop. Right, thank you. My question then? is, in, in respect to the 1.6 billion cap, if in a self-managed super fund, which is in pension phase, one had direct property in it, would the advice be to get those direct properties revalued before the end of June to bring the super fund account up to its maximum? It's good to see a friendly face, and I'm glad it wasn't a heckle, John. Um, it makes sense for everybody who has a self-managed super fund to... I mean, interesting thing is, all assets within super funds should be valued at market value at the end of financial year. So, therefore, it doesn't... You know, the thing will be, and uh, this is 
hopefully the tax office is not listening. It does make sense, though, if there can be different ways of valuing assets. Um, I've got an example of a, a client who had um, a property which is a child mining centre. Now, that property can be valued as a bare property, which has a value, or it can be valued as a property which is a child mining centre, which is a different valuation method. From a point of view of wanting to maximise the money you're going to have in pension accounts going forward, which, which goes to some of the heart of, of what you're talking about, is, and as long as the valuation is done by someone independent so that therefore there can be no fingers pointed at the trustees, if the assets that are going to be kept in the pension account have been valued and they're valued in such a way that the chances that they will increase in market value and be realised down the track, that's what you would be going for. If you've got a, an asset that's fully valued and you want to get make sure that there's not, not going to have much of a chance of increasing, you'd be wanting to have that asset that would be transferred back to accumulation at its fullest market value that you can get. So, you know, often valuers will look at things and say, well, you want it on the high side or the low side. Rule is, if it's going to be going into the pension bucket, or if you're going to be looking at from the pension side of things, you might be saying, well, I prefer lower than higher. If it's on the side that's going to be going back to accumulation, you want to maximise the capital gain tax benefit, it's the higher. But if it were, if it were to stay in, in pension mode? Yeah, well, you, you, you'd be wanting to get the valuation done, but you, you would want to have the valuer say, look, I don't want you to be giving me a bullish, you know, top of the market, I want you to end up giving me what a reasonable value would be, um, given that there's a nuclear waste dump next door or something like this, come up with some reason for that. <laughs> um, I'm not quite up, up to what my situation involves with the pension phase. Um, say two million in uh, self-managed super fund accumulation, recently retired, 59. Um, oh, I the, he can, he can when, uh, as of 1st of June, I should go to 1.6 million um, in a pension account and say 400,000 in accumulation. Uh, is, and then, so then I have to start taking out money from the 1.6 as a minimum pension, is that correct? Sorry, 59 yes. years of age? Well, uh, yeah, yeah, at 59, there's going to be tax to be paid on the on the fund with a with a rebate uh, potentially. If you're fully retired, is it sorry, is it TTR or, or an account based pension? Are you 55? No, just, just a soup um, accumulation account. No, no TTR. Sorry, I thought you were talking about switching it to pension. No, no, that that's the confusion. Um, I've got just two million. No pension. Haven't taken any pension out. Uh, the 1.6 million of that will go into a pension phase, I imagine. No, no, until you elect to turn on the pension, you can leave that money sitting in accumulation forever. Right. So uh, you, there's no, you don't have to. The, the reason for going on to into pension potentially, one reason is all of the the assets that support the pension fund become tax free. So anything they earn is tax free. Uh, any gains they make are tax free. What you have in accumulation is that the assets are taxed at 15% or 10% for capital gains. The government is very happy to let you uh, uh, leave any assets that you want uh, that you accumulated in the accumulation phase because you're continuing to pay tax. Yeah, but that's the assets. point. Shouldn't I be going to 1.6 million into the pension? Okay. Uh, okay. So if you want to turn on a pension, then uh, yes, you'll be switching 1.6 million of those into a, a, a pension fund and 300,000 would stay in accumulation. Um, why are you doing that? Um, at, at age 59, the, the fund, unless you're 55 and permanently retired, uh, sorry, at, at age 59, you're still going to pay some tax on whatever you earn from uh, whatever you take as a pension from the fund. Until you turn 60, it's not tax-free. If you, but then it depends on whether you're turning on a, on a transition to retirement pension or an account-based pension as to whether the fund itself is tax-free. Now, if you're a preservation age, if you're 59 and, um, uh, and, and permanent, permanently retired from the workforce, then you, you'll have a, a, an account-based pension on which there's no tax paid inside the fund. 
if you're 59 and still working and therefore it is a, a transition to retirement pension, then the fund itself will continue to pay some tax on earnings. If you've got $2 million in the super fund now and it's all accumulation and you're 59, um, there is a no-brainer strategy, especially if you've met a condition of release or, the, in other words, if you're retired, you wouldn't want to start a transition to retirement pension um, because you'd probably have to cease it after the 3rd of June because it's going to be just treated like an accumulation account anyway. But if you haven't made concessional contributions, and again, depending on what your tax-free and taxable component is, you should be getting 540000 out of your superannuation fund before the 3rd of June, starting a TTR pension from what's left in there for the rest of the year, putting in the 540 as a non-concessional contribution, that will give you effectively, in the end, you could start a pension from that and you'll have two pension accounts, one which is 540, and which is all tax-free, and the other one which is you know, mainly taxable, and that gives you some some, um, some possibilities, but you need to get advice on that one. Very quickly. Uh, very quickly. Thank you. Just, uh, just have a question down here from the from the front. Okay, well, all right, we'll do that one first and then this one last and, and then we'll move out. Okay, to whoever can answer the question, it's in relation to overseas pensions and the 1.6. If you're in receipt of either a government pension or a private pension from either employment or service overseas, um, how does that impact the 1.6? My understanding is that the pension accounts transfer balance only relates to Australian pensions because Australian pensions are so um, taxed advantaged. Uh, you're already, if you're receiving a pension from overseas, whether it be a UK pension, whether it be the normal pension that a lot of UK residents have, have got, and whether it be a corporate one, that just comes in as foreign investment pension income. It's not counted as Australian pension income. So my understanding is it, it has no effect. In fact, when you go back to it, when they say, what is it that's going to affect the pension account transfer balance, I haven't seen anywhere written that the, the multiple of a pension... Uh, that, you know, the 16 times needs to include overseas pensions. So, uh, without being unequivocal, I, I, I think definitely not, but with a little bit of a 5% doubt because I, I'm fairly sure it's not. What is... Is there any reason not to realise the unrealised capital gains and leave the unrealised capital losses for the accumulation phase later? If you're going to be claiming the, the, the CGD concession, there's no re reason to realise them uh, unless you're wanting to convert the, the, the fund to cash and have the cash go to another fund or something like this. Too much. Yeah, es essentially, my personal situation is that we would probably go to all accumulation and not and withdraw from the pension entirely. Well, I, I don't quite understand why... Um, um, purely from a cash flow point of view and the requirement to draw down. You don't, draw, need, you don't need the income. Don't need the income. Okay, well, you just leave it all in accumulation then, uh, at where it's paying 15% um, uh, paying tax maximum. Um, but depending on your situation, again, we can't give personal advice here, but having the amount, uh, 1.6 million in pension, uh, if uh, and drawing whatever the minimum pension is, if you're able to get that money back into super via non-concessional concessional contributions, non-concessional contributions particularly in changing the, the tax nature of your fund. Um, uh, yeah, look, there will be, there will undoubtedly be some situations where it possibly doesn't make sense, but uh, taking tax-free income uh, and doing something with it, uh, you know, it can be done unless you really just do not need any of the money from your, uh, from what you've got in superannuation. Max? It's one of those um, questions that no one will be able to give you the answer properly until the numbers are run. Whenever I'm doing planning, it just comes down to dollars and cents and taking into account taxation. So the numbers will need to be run on scenario one, leaving 3.2 million in pension accounts with the minimum pension coming out and having that uh, income being effectively tax-free and projecting forward on a number of assumptions, assumed in earnings rates as to what's the value of the assets going to be, say, by 2030 or 2040. 
um, and then compare that to the other scenario where the money comes out of pension, it goes into accumulation, and the super fund's paying tax on that income now, and yes, it's not coming out. Um, really, the only way you'll get the, the correct answer is to run the numbers. Have done. Thanks.